Começa hoje a Semana Nacional de Ciência e Tecnologia, considerada um dos maiores eventos de divulgação científica do mundo, que acontece em todo o país. O tema desse ano é Mudanças Climáticas, Desastres Naturais e Prevenção de Risco. Além da promoção de inúmeras atividades de divulgação científica em todo o país, serão estimulados os debates dos diversos aspectos e as evidências científicas sobre o impacto das atividades humanas no clima do planeta e as medidas preventivas mais adequadas a serem adotadas em escala local e global. Por outro lado, a Assembleia Geral das Nações Unidas declarou 2011 como o Ano Internacional da Química, AIQ, e está estimulando todos os países a realizarem atividades com o objetivo de aumentar a consciência coletiva sobre a importância da química e suas contribuições para o bem-estar da humanidade. Na SNCT 2011, serão promovidas atividades voltadas para o lema do AIQ do no Brasil, Química para o um Mundo Melhor. A Sociedade Brasileira de Química tem o orgulho de participar dessa celebração e gostaria de manifestar sua imensa satisfação de poder contar com vossas presenças nesta cerimônia da Semana Nacional de Ciência e Tecnologia. Recebemos hoje como convidado de honra o pesquisador da Columbia University, Martin Schaub, um dos ganhadores do Prêmio Nobel de Química de 2008 pela descoberta e desenvolvimento de proteína verde fluorescente. E convidamos a todos a assistirem sua palestra. Passaremos agora a palavra para a professora Cláudia Moraes de Rezende, coordenadora do Ano Internacional da Química aqui no Brasil. Obrigada pela atenção de todos e boa tarde. Boa tarde a todos. A Ana já fez uma bela apresentação. Muito obrigada pela sua presença. E eu gostaria de informar a quem ainda não conhece o nosso site, o site, o portal do Ano Internacional da Química, que é o www.quimica2011.org.br. Nesse portal, que foi criado exclusivamente para as comemorações do Ano Internacional da Química, vocês vão se assustar de ver o número de ações que estão sendo realizadas aqui no Brasil. Ao lado dos Estados Unidos, o Brasil é o país com o maior número de atividades comemorativas ao Ano Internacional da Química. Nós fizemos livros, exposições itinerantes, estão disponibilizadas no portal do Ano Internacional Livre, mediante uma senha muito fácil. O nosso webmaster, inclusive, está aqui nos filmando. Se vocês quiserem depois alguma informação específica, ele pode trazer para vocês mais alguma coisa. Então, é muito bom a gente ver que a gente alcançou, o sucesso do Ano Internacional da Química é grande. E, e a, nós temos várias ações de continuidade para os próximos anos, porque definitivamente nós não podemos deixar isso acabar. Então é realmente assim, está sendo uma oportunidade de vida trabalhar em cima desse projeto e ver tantos resultados positivos para a química no Brasil. Bom, nós não podemos nos alongar muito aqui, porque após essa conferência, o professor Schauf irá para o Complexo do Alemão abrir a Semana Nacional de Ciência e Tecnologia com o ilustríssimo ministro Mercadante, e mais a comitiva do governo do estado do Rio de Janeiro, representando a química. Então, eu acho que é realmente uma vitória para a ciência brasileira esse tipo de ação. O experimento do pH do planeta é um experimento que foi lançado na abertura do ano internacional da química pela Unesco e pela ONU, em Paris. Imediatamente, nós abraçamos o projeto, entre outros, e trouxemos e já distribuímos pelo projeto que a Sociedade Brasileira de Química está coordenando, na minha figura, 35 mil kits para todo o Brasil, para medir, avaliar a qualidade da água. Como é que vai ser o retorno desse projeto? As crianças medem com as suas escolas o pH, escrevem num portal. Esse portal é brasileiro, depois a gente transfere esses dados para o portal internacional. Ou seja, o ano que vem nós teremos o pH do planeta, o pH das águas do planeta, sendo avaliados pelas nossas crianças no mundo todo. Então eu acho que o projeto se explica por si só. É de uma beleza sobremaneira. Bom, vamos à conversa sobre o professor Schauff, breve. O professor Martin Schauff nasceu em Chicago, nos Estados Unidos, em 1947. Ele é neto de imigrantes 
da fronteira russo-polonesa. A família dele é, veio para os Estados Unidos, posteriormente se estabeleceu em Cincinnati no início do século XX. Em suas próprias palavras, que a gente teve a oportunidade de escutar ontem, num passeio no Jardim Botânico, ele é um amante da música, influenciado por seu pai, L. Schauff, que é guitarrista de, foi guitarrista de profissão. O professor Schauff toca, violino, toca violão clássico, hobby que mantém até os dias de hoje e inspira, segundo ele, seus sonhos como cientista. Sua mãe, que segundo ele próprio foi uma grande mulher, muito inteligente, e pela qual ele sempre demonstra um grande carinho, herdou de sua avó uma fábrica de roupas, onde Martin trabalhou na década de 70, mas sempre mantendo seus estudos com afinco por orientação dos pais. Iniciou seu estudo de curso superior em Harvard, em 1965, na área de bioquímica, se formando em biologia. No começo de sua carreira científica, trabalhou timidamente na área de química dos açúcares. E logo abandonou esse percalço. Ele comenta que lembra de sua graduação com pontos muito positivos, mas também vários negativos. Muitas vezes ele se sentia intimidado com os alunos e professores iluminados de Harvard, o que o deixou muito pouco confiante durante um bom tempo. Ele teve notas ruins em química e em física. Essa eu tinha que comentar. Isso está no site do Nobel, viu gente? Eu tirei da autobiografia dele. E a pressão o fazia resolver tudo sozinho, pois isso era muito bem visto pelos colegas e pelos professores, sinal de independência. Mas ele salienta que nem sempre essa decisão solitária foi positiva, mas ele teve a oportunidade de reverter isso em parcerias futuras, que o levaram ao Nobel. É, na graduação, o professor Martin Schauff se envolveu com fisiologia celular e ao mesmo tempo com política universitária. Ele também foi capitão do tipo de natação de Harvard e cursou, junto com as disciplinas obrigatórias, disciplinas de direito, de teatro e de literatura russa. Ele reclamava com veemência contra a guerra do Vietnã. Após encerrada a graduação, o professor Schauff lecionou em algumas universidades, inclusive em Harvard, na área de bioquímica. Ele lembra com carinho de seus tempos no curso de doutorado e do pós-doutorado ainda em Harvard, em neurobiologia, e destaca que este período era o céu. O professor Martin aprecia extremamente o desenvolvimento de experimentos e por isso acredita ter tido a oportunidade de, ter, de, de dar importantes contribuições em áreas interdisciplinares, misturando química com biologia e neurofisiologia. Após o período de Harvard, ele foi realizar um outro pós-doc no Laboratório de Biologia Molecular em Cambridge, na Inglaterra, com Sidney Brenner, Brenner e John Solston, ambos agraciados com o Prêmio Nobel de Fisiologia e Medicina em 2002. Lá ele iniciou os estudos de neurobiologia no nematódio C. elegans, organismo com o qual, posteriormente, foi agraciado com o Nobel, juntamente com a, com a proteína verde fluorescente. Martin Schauff deixou a Inglaterra em 1982 e ingressou como professor na Universidade de Columbia, em Nova York, no Departamento de Ciências Biológicas, no qual ele permanece até hoje. Em 1988, ele assistiu um seminário que definitivamente marcou o seu percurso para o Nobel. Doug Pressure estava iniciando seus estudos no sequenciamento genético e clonagem da proteína verde fluorescente, a GFP. Era a primeira vez que o professor Schauff ouvia falar dessa proteína. Ficou excitado, segundo suas palavras, com o fato de existir uma proteína fluorescente por si própria e imediatamente vislumbrou a possibilidade de expressá-la nesse organismo C. elegans e o que culminou com esse trabalho que a gente vai observar, né, vai ter o prazer de assistir hoje. O professor Schauff casou-se com a esposa Tully, que eu não vou falar nada a pedido deles agora, ele se casou em 1989, ele gosta de falar sobre isso, e teve uma filha, Sara. Então ele pediu que mantivesse essa parte, que deixasse essa parte para ele comentar. Bom, até hoje ele mantém seus estudos no nematódio C. elegans, um importante modelo da biologia do desenvolvimento. Ele publicou até hoje mais de 200 artigos em periódicos científicos renomados 
e 16 deles têm mais de 100 citações. A contribuição sobre a proteína verde fluorescente como um marcador para expressão genética o levou ao Prêmio Nobel, juntamente com Roger Tsen e Osamu Shinomura. E este trabalho está entre os 20 mais citados na área de biologia molecular e genética. Professor Schau, thank you. Come on, please. This on? Uh, it's going to be a little dark. So I thank you very much for that introduction. I'm not exactly sure what you said, but there was a lot of laughter, so I, I'm going to accept it. Uh, but thank you. It's been uh, really wonderful. I've, I, I came on Friday night, and I've had uh, just a spectacular time so far in Rio, and uh, you know, it's like everything else. You judge things by how much you want to come back. I know I want to come back. So this is just really wonderful. So I, I want to tell you a little bit about the work that I was involved in that uh, had these people in Sweden give me this wonderful prize. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit of why uh, I was excited about it at first. And uh, tell you a little bit about at least from my perspective, how science sometimes gets done. Because I think I know that many of you are in high school. And uh, when I was in high school, we were sort of taught certain things by the examples of what scientists were. We were told scientists were all geniuses. We were told scientists work alone, although they might have an assistant named Igor. Uh, we were told that. Scientists, by the examples of all the scientists that we were, were shown, that they used the scientific method. They came up with a hypothesis and tested that. And then we were told, well, actually, by example, they're all men, except for Marie Curie. And then, and, and, and they work alone. Well, maybe Watson and Crick work together. And uh, they were also not only almost all men, they were almost all European men. Uh, or people descended from European men. Uh, all of these things are not true, and I hope that this example uh, puts some of those uh, to the test and shows that they're not true. So I did not start out thinking I would ever get a prize, in, really in anything, but certainly not a prize in chemistry. I'm a biologist, and the problem that I've been working on for now uh, almost 35 years is a problem of the mechanical senses. Biologists know how we can detect the world around us if the signal is light. We know that when light comes through our eyes, it gets detected by a molecule called rhodopsin. And we know the mo that molecule, we know how it then activates other molecules and what happens to send a signal into our brain that we've seen something. We've known about rhodopsin for over 125 years. But we also know about other senses, the sense, senses that use chemicals as the signal. We have a lot of these, taste, smell. We sense chemicals inside our body, whether they're neurotransmitters or hormones because of receptors. And people have a pretty good idea about what these protein receptors are and how they work. So we know how we sense the world if the signals are light or chemical. What we don't know is how we sense the world physically. How when a cell is moved or touched, it leads to a, an electrical signal that tells us something about the world. And we have a lot of senses like that. Our sense of hearing, our sense of balance. We sense blood pressure within our bodies. We sense uh, our skins, you know, we have the sense of touch. In our skins, we have five different types of cells that sense touch. And all of them together make up our sense of touch. If you send an astronaut out into space, 
there's no pressure on his or her bones. The bones start falling apart because the bones need to feel the pressure. And for example, on Earth, if you play tennis and you use just one arm to play tennis, all that pressure on that arm is going to make the bones stronger. Out in space, there's no pressure on the bones. They start to fall apart. We would really like to understand that, if, especially if we want to have long-term space flight. All of these senses have one thing in common. We don't have any idea how they work, which means for somebody interested in a question like myself, I'm going to be in business for a while. Now, I have been studying this problem by not looking at a human sense or even a mouse sense, but by looking at a very small worm, a worm that's one millimeter long as an adult. And you can't see it very well in this picture, I'm afraid, but this is a picture of a newly hatched worm. This is about one quarter of a millimeter long. And the important thing for you to know about this animal is that it's transparent. We can put it on a microscope and we can see right through it, right into it. It's also very small, so we can, under the microscope, see every single cell in the animal. But we can't really distinguish one cell from another. I have been studying the sense of touch. You might ask, how do you test touch in an animal that's this small? We take, we, it's very sophisticated. We take an eyebrow hair and we glue it to a toothpick. And under the microscope, we tickle the animal. If the animal moves, it can sense the touch. If it doesn't move, it might be dead, but usually it just means it's insensitive. And we've been able to collect many mutant animals that are defective in touch. They let us address two questions. One question, because some of the mutants result in animals that don't have the cells, allow us to ask a developmental biology question. How does an animal make different types of cells? The other mutants, the cells are made, they look perfectly normal, but they don't work. And those are the ones that help us try to understand the molecules that sense touch. And in fact, uh, about Seven years ago now, we finally published the, pa the paper showing that we had found the first animal sensor of touch. It's one of our, the products of one of our genes. But when we were studying the genes, one of the first things that people do is try to clone the genes, get the DNA for that gene. And then when you have that DNA, you want to know, is it expressed? Is it made in the cells that you're interested in, maybe it's needed in some other cell. What cell turns the gene on? Now, at the time we were beginning our experiments, or at least the beginning of this story, there were several methods that could answer that question. One method was, since DNA makes RNA, makes protein, that we could make an antibody against the protein and ask, where does the antibody and you can't see this at all, I'm sure, in the picture, but believe me, it's there. I'm afraid this is going to be a problem throughout this talk. I apologize for that. Um, another way, other than using an antibody, uh, is to use, a, you know, genes have two parts. They have one part that says what protein should be made, and they have a regulatory part that says how much where and when it should be made. And if you take that regulatory part and you put it on something that you can see, then you can also follow where that gene has been activated. And so one method that people used was to use the bacterial gene called beta, uh, LACZ, which made an enzyme called beta-galactosidase. And maybe you'll just be able to see that there's some staining here, here, and here. These are where our touch sensing cells are. Another way, since if the gene is activated, it makes RNA, you can use a procedure called in situ hybridization. And that shows where the RNA has been made. And I have a picture of that too, but again, you can't see it, but there's, you should see these two dots. Those are two cells there. There's another one here. There's two here, another one up here. 
All of these methods have one thing, a couple things in common. You know, in order to do them, you have to really prepare the tissues, and it takes several days. It's a lot of work. You have to kill the animals, and then you have to permeabilize them, basically poke holes in them, chemically usually, so that you can get the antibody into the animal, or the substrate for the enzyme, or the probes for the in situ hybridization. And as a result of looking at these dead and prepared specimens, you see a snapshot of their life. You see one moment in time. You don't have an opportunity to see how things change unless you go and look at these things, one, you know, prepare one at this time and then prepare another at this time. And once you've prepared them and you've looked at them, there's really nothing that you can do with it other than go on and look at something else. You have to start everything all over again. And it's at this point, we were just starting to do these experiments in my lab, that, I, that inspiration struck. Now, everybody has a different example of what they think about inspiration. I will tell you mine. It's a cartoon by, the, uh, by Nick Kim. Here it says at the bottom, Cambridge, 1953, shortly before discovering the structure of DNA, Watson and Crick, depressed by their lack of progress, visit the local pub, where a patron is saying, I'll have a double, Felix. My inspiration did not come from a pub. I wish it did, but it, it didn't. But it came from a seminar. And in this seminar, a man named Paul Bram was giving the talk. He started talking not about his work at the beginning, but the work of another person, this man, Osamu Shimamura who shared the Nobel Prize with me, and his work on this bacteria. Uh, in fact, that's jellyfish, sorry. Now, with if you have some time, and you don't mind listening to it in English, please go to the nobelprize.org website and listen, listen to his speech. He is a remarkable individual. At the age of 16, he was told, that's it. You can't be in school anymore. You have to work in a factory. He goes from the city he's going to school at. He goes to the valley next door, because there were mountains. So there was goes across the mountains to the valley next door, and he starts working in the factory. But this time is 1945, and the city is Nagasaki, Japan, where the second atomic bomb happened. Because he was in the valley next door with the mountains between him, he was protected from the atomic bomb blasts. Although he did go in and rescue people and care for people in the days after the explosion. He then couldn't go to college because the university was destroyed. He went, instead, eventually they built the only part of the university near where he lived, which was the pharmacy school. After going to the pharmacy school, he started working as a technician in a lab in Nagoya University. But he was, his boss recognized how really bright he was, and so he gave him a project to do. What this boss was interested in was trying to understand the biochemistry of how a crustacean produced light. Now, there's many different organisms, over 50 different organisms, that can generate light. Fireflies, glowworms, bacteria, jellyfish, crustaceans. And this crustacean called Cyprodyna had stumped people. The professor had given the project to many of his graduate students, and they had all failed at it. He gave it to Osamu Shimamura, and he succeeded. He then got an invitation, after having done that work, to come and work in the United States. And as a parting present, so I understand, from his, his boss, his boss arranged that he be given a PhD for what he had done. He went to the United States, started working with a man named Frank Johnston, and they decided to find out why this jellyfish produced light. What was the biochemistry there? 
When he did this, they, they went to a place in Washington State uh, called Friday Harbor Labs. And then there was some sort of argument between them or disagreement about how to proceed. And Frank Johnston went off and did something else. Osama Shimomura is one of these people that he keeps staying on the problem until he can solve it. But for those of you who think that scientists always get the, their experiments work the first time and every time, this did not happen. Osama tried to isolate the protein that made this jellyfish glow. Now, this is a bad picture because the jellyfish does not have, does not shine with a blue light. It shines with a green light. So Shimomura, he paid his children a penny for every 100 jellyfish they would bring in. They collected the jellyfish from them. And he'd grind them up, and he'd do the preparations, and he could not get any light. He had a slight breakthrough halfway through the summer, but for the most part, every experiment he did failed. One night, after another day of complete failure in the lab, he took all of his samples. He was done with the experiment. It had not worked again. He threw them into the sink. Now, in the sink were jellyfish parts and seawater and all sorts of stuff. He just threw the protein prep in with them. And then he was going home. It was late at night, so he turned off the lights. He's about to go home. He looks back at the sink. And the sink is glowing brightly with blue, a brilliant blue light. And he realizes, wait a minute, there's seawater. Seawater has calcium in it. I haven't had any calcium in any of my preps. He goes back the next day. Calcium unlocks the light. And he uses it to purify a protein which he calls after the jellyfish, calls a quarant. And with calcium, it produces this beautiful blue light. But as a, So there's the scientific method, right? Throw your stuff in the sink. That's the way to do it. He then has a problem because the light that's produced by this chemical reaction is blue. But the jellyfish don't give a blue light. They give a green light. So he says there must be something else something that converts the blue to the green. And he goes and he looks at all his samples again with a handheld ultraviolet lamp to activate it. And sure enough, he finds something. He called it the green protein. We call it the green fluorescent protein. It's a protein that's fluorescent. That means blue light comes in, it's absorbed, and then it gives off green light. So that was called GFP. And all together, quorin, calcium, GFP, and the jellyfish produce the green light. I'm listening to this seminar where this man is talking about this story. And I'm saying to myself, it's just a protein. I can put the DNA for that protein into my worms. If I do that, I can see it, not by permeabilizing them, not by treating them in any special way. I can just shine blue light on them, and wherever that gene is turned on, it'll be green. So I was very excited. I was so excited that I cannot tell you anything else that the man said. I just started thinking about my experiments. Fortunately, the next day, I was able to find that there was someone who was preparing the DNA for this, and that man is this, Douglas Prasher. And Douglas and I got together, and I had a graduate student a couple years later who did the experiment. His name was Dia Skirkin. And I should tell you something about the color scheme that I'm going to show in my slide. Anybody whose name is in blue is a collaborator, someone I've worked with but not in my lab. Anyone whose name is in red is someone from my laboratory. Anybody whose name is in black did something I wish I had done. Well, Gia did the experiment of putting GFP into bacteria. And one month after she started graduate school, this is a page from her lab notebook, and these are the green fluorescing bacteria she found on that very first day. She was able to take a picture. Now, there's an interesting thing about this laboratory page. 
And not that it has strongly fluorescing E. coli, but actually this part, that she used a microscope in engineering. Now, she had actually gotten a master's degree in our engineering school working in this laboratory looking at fluorescence. And she knew what a good fluorescence microscope was. So when she came to my lab, she knew that my microscope was a piece of junk. And if she had used my microscope, she might have looked down at it and said, well, I think it's, it maybe it worked, but I'm not sure. Uh, no, it probably didn't work. And we would have, that would have been the end of the story. But she had the great good sense to go back to her lab that had the good microscope. And she looked at it, and she was absolutely able to see the green fluorescent bacteria. There was a lot of jumping around in the lab after this. We were very happy to, uh, to see this result. You might ask, why didn't anyone else do this experiment? It's pretty simple. Just put it, you know, take the gene, put it in another place. But the thing is that most of the people that worked on green fluorescent protein believed that it alone was not going to be enough. You needed something else. And let me tell you why. In a protein, you probably know that proteins are made up of a, they're a long chain of amino acids, one linked to the other, so a, a line. GFP is slightly different. It starts off like this, a line of amino acids. Here's part of that line. We have this series here, uh, phenylalanine, there's tyrosine that goes around here, glycine, and so on. Out here, and this is just a small part of it. But GFP is different because this part that should be just a straight line in the mature protein, there's a five-membered ring made right there. Changes it. And no one knew how this was done. They thought maybe it needed one enzyme to do it, a converting enzyme, or maybe two or three or ten or who knows how many. And if that were the case, GFP would not be very useful because then you'd have to add all those things in, too. So uh, we took a chance. We just gambled that, well, let's try it. Let's see what happens. And it worked without adding anything else. Um, and we were very happy. There were a couple of other people that tried it. They, had, they used a slightly different method, and the method caused problems. I won't go into that. But uh, we were just delighted that this worked in bacteria. And let me quickly tell you, uh, uh, so we put it into worms. And then you can't actually see that there's a worm here in this, what was the cover of science when we published our paper. But there is a worm. And I was very proud of this picture because this is a nerve cell. And you can't see the process here very well. That's the growing, that's the growing end of the nerve cell. We were able to watch the nerve grow in the living animal. No longer had to look at dead animals to do this. We could watch the thing going on. Now, I, I want to take a little bit of time and talk about the problems of scientific publishing. So we sent the paper to Science. Science is a very prestigious journal. It has a large readership, and we wanted as many people as possible to read about this procedure as possible. So we sent it in. But some of you may know that science is um, a little snooty, a little conceited. And so they don't just send out the papers for people to review. They have their own group inside the journal that sits around and decides whether a paper is important enough to be sent out for review. And they called me up and said, you know, we like your paper, but we're not sending it out for review. And I said, what's wrong with it? They said, we don't like the title. I said, what's wrong with the title? I thought it was a very nice title. It was Green Fluorescent Protein, a New Marker for Gene Expression. And they said, well, you know, in science, everything that we publish is new. So unless you change the title, we're not sending it out for review. I do not like to be told what to do. And so I did change the title. But the title I changed it to was a little bit long. 
The Aquaria Victoria green fluorescent protein needs no exogenously added component to produce a fluorescent product in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. This title is the whole paper. <laughs> but they it didn't say the word new, and they sent it out for review, and the reviewers were very kind, and they said, they haven't learned anything new, but publish it anyway. <laughs> and so we did, and the copy editor, after it was accepted, the copy editor called me up and said, you know, your title is a bit long. Do you think you could change it? So the final title was Green Fluorescent Protein as a Marker for Gene Expression. <laughs> the second problem that we had came from this picture. I was exceptionally proud of this picture because, as I've told you, we could see a nerve cell growing out in a living animal. And I wanted this as the example that we would be able to give to people. And so when I did this, uh, I sent the picture in, and they told me it was accepted for the cover. I was very happy about that. And then the cover editor called me up. And she said, you know, I just have to tell you, there's one color that doesn't reproduce well on the cover. We never really like to use it ever. And that's green. <laughs> Is it possible we could change the color of this picture? <laughs> I said, absolutely not. And in fact, it's not the prettiest picture, but it's it's OK. I'm happy with it. The third problem of publishing this paper came because we had already given away samples of the DNA for other people to test. And we really wanted them to test these things. And people were already starting to write me and say, it works in my system, or it works in my system. And so when we wrote this, we wanted to cite that other people had gotten success. It wasn't just bacteria and worms, but other cells. and that it really could work in many, many places, if not every place. All, almost all of these people, we said, we have permission to cite your work even though you haven't published it yet. And they all said, yes, go ahead. We're happy to have, you gave us this before you publish, please, feel free. One person gave me a very hard time and sent this letter. Dear Marty, it is perfectly fine with me if you cite our work following you do the following three conditions. One, you make coffee every Saturday morning, ready by 8.30 for the next two months. Two, you prepare a special French dinner at a time of your choosing. And three, you empty, empty the garbage nightly for the next month. This is my wife. <laughs> but what she did was the the, she did the next experiment with GFE, and arguably she did a more important experiment. I told you that I took that regulatory part of the gene and used it to turn on GFP. What she did is she kept the regulatory part, the protein coding part, and then she added GFP. So now what was made was the protein with this lantern hung on it. And wherever that protein went, you would be able to see it in the cell because you could see where the green was. And she worked actually in a cell. Have it here. Oh, you can hardly see it. These are called the nurse cells. They're part. Of, this is in the fruit fly, Drosophila, and they make a protein that she was interested in. And this protein actually gets transported from these cells into this, which is going to be the oocyte, the beginning egg of the animal. And she could watch the protein made in one cell be distributed into the other. And that was had a profound effect. So I claim that she has read that I did all of those things. She claims I have never paid up. We still debate this. And I have to say something I'm a little afraid to say, but it, it may be the case. I gave this talk in January, something similar in January in India. And it was very nice. They had a reporter there who wrote about it for the newspaper. The only thing he wrote about was my wife's letter. <laughs> we have a, a pharmacy that we go to. And one day I walked in. And the pharmacist, after filling my prescription, said to me, 
you're the guy who won that Nobel Prize, aren't you? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, very nice. Congratulations. About a month or two later, there was a different pharmacist. My wife went into the store to get some medicines. And he said, you're the wife of the guy who got the Nobel Prize. And she went, yes. And he said, I loved your letter. <laughs> Let me tell you why GFP was so exciting to have it work. First, all you need to do is put the DNA, and there's many ways of putting DNA into organisms, and it will then be inherited. Not only will the organism that you put it in have it, but all of its progeny will have it. So you, once you put it in, you don't have to remake it, it's going to be there. And it, using it doesn't hurt the animal or the plant or anything because all you're doing, you're not killing it or puncturing it or anything. You're simply shining blue light on it. Organisms tolerate having blue light shine, shining on them. It's very small, and this small size means it can diffuse everywhere in the cell. So you can see all the parts in the cell. Some of these other things are too big, and they stay only in the cell body. And finally, as I've said several times now, you can look at things in living animals. For the first time, we had a dynamic way of looking at biology. And this was very exciting to be able to follow things over time. And I'll show you some examples of this. But the other thing that's remarkable, I mentioned a little while ago, I said my wife put GFP on a protein. It was like hanging a lantern or having a flashlight hanging on it. The remarkable thing when George Phillips and independently Jim Remington looked at the x-ray structure of the GFP molecule, they found, I think, everybody's astonishment that the molecule looks like a lantern. It has these called beta strands. There's 11 of them that make a can cylinder closed at the top and bottom. And right up the middle, there's one more strand. And that modification that I told you about, that's right here. That's where the light comes from. So it really does look like a little lantern. It, it really is, to me, it's the most, one of the most beautiful chemical structures in the world. Well, GFP has been used in lots of different organisms. I'll give you some examples here. I hope you can see some of them. Here it is in worms, fruit fly. This you can hardly see. It's a canola plant. These are mice, zebrafish. And this character here is Alba, the GFP bunny. Now, I believe he's actually from Brazil. Eduardo Koch, the artist, he lives in Chicago, Illinois now in the States. But he commissioned a French company to make him this pet. And what he did is he went to various shows that he would do try to stimulate people into looking at the connections between art and technology and art and science. Alba lived to a ripe old age as a rabbit goes. The GFP did not harm her in any way. And, uh, but she's no longer around. I heard a rumor, I don't know if it's true, that he might now have a GFP puppy. I'm not sure. In any case, over here on the right-hand side, are some examples of some cells. A little hard to see, but this is a Purkinje cell. This is a cell, back of your head, in the cerebellum, and it has all this extensive branching. And although the picture is a little dim, I hope you can see at least some of the branches here where the GFP has gone everywhere to let people see what the entire cell looks like. I want to show you two movies. In these movies, I have to tell you a little cell biology. So when a cell divides into two cells, there's, two th there's a number of things that happen. But you start off with one nucleus, and then you eventually get two nuclei. You have two sets of chromosomes that meet in the middle and then have to be separated from each other to go into the two cells. These are separated on what's called the spindle. And the spindle is made up of microtubules. The nucleus has all this membrane around it, it's called the nuclear envelope. That's all the biology you're going to have to really know. Let me tell you what you're going to see. In the first movie I'm going to show you, 
we have GFP attached to a, a microtubule protein. So whenever this spindle forms, which only occurs when the cells divide, not before or after, you will see the spindle forming. And you'll be able, it's a time-lapse movie, so it's greatly speeded up. You're going to be watching the beginning of fruit fly development. The second movie I'm going to show is one in which GFP has been put on, not to a microtubule protein, but a signal that says, if there's a nucleus, get me inside, called the nuclear localization signal. So if you have this, if you have a nucleus, it'll go in. But when the cell starts to divide, of course, there is no nucleus. It's everywhere in the cell. Then when this reforms here, it'll go back inside. So let's see the movie so you get an idea of what happens when you watch things over time with GFP. So this, oh, you may not be able to see this at all. You can barely, I, ho I hope you can see the spindles forming. Now, in the fruit fly, there are no cell boundaries. All, there's just nuclei that keep dividing. As a result, I hope you can notice in this film, if it's going very fast, not normal time, there's the spindles again dividing, that all the spindles are formed and do their job at the same time. Everything is in synchrony, which is what Rosalind Silverman Gavrilla calls this movie. She was a graduate student in Canada when she made this movie. I stole it. I uh, did not have anything to do with this. This is one of those things I wish I had done. Actually, I got this from the website of the American Society for Cell Biology. I'll let that run, but I want to talk about the film on the other side. This is the one with the nuclear localization signal. And she's modified this slightly in that it's still just GFP, but she's falsely colored the picture. So that if there's a little GFP, you see blue or green. But as you get more and more GFP, you go to higher, or to towards the red in, in the rainbow. So you start off with blue, green, an orange, yellow, red, or yellow, orange, red, and so red is the most. So what you're seeing here is not the color of the thing, but a color representing how much there is. And as you can see here in this picture, there's a lot of these nuclei. So now let me run this movie so you can see this. Nuclei have come out. Now it's everywhere because the cells are all, the nuclei are all dividing. But now the nuclei reform and the GFP goes inside the nuclei. And then they come apart again and go all over this embryo, and then the nuclei reform at another time, and the GFP is transported into that again. Now, the thing I want you to notice about this is that it's not synchronous. She actually names this after the Van Gogh uh, painting, Starry Night. It looks a little bit like that. But it's not synchronous. There's a wave of, of what happens. You see that they start here, and then you get here. And when this goes away, it's going to start going away here. And you go up here. So it's not synchronous. So something else is going on here in this picture. A friend of mine and I think that this is actually that she had damaged these cells <laughs> to, to do this. But it shows you an example of how you can, by looking over time, you can see things taking place that you could never really look at if you were just having that snapshot. Now, in my lab, we use GFP in a lot of different ways, some of which you can see here, some of which you can't. We use it to tell us what cells have GFP in them or, or turn on gene. We use it to say, where are the proteins? And I think you maybe can make out that there's dots here. So this is a protein that's not evenly distributed in the cell. It's only in special places. And it, asks, it invites us to ask the question, why is it only in these special places? What puts it there? We're studying that. But you know, once you can see something, then you can do all sorts of other experiments with it. So these are nerve cells. So there's the cell body of one. There's the cell body of another. And they send out 
extensions, processes, that go up to the front of the animal. This cell sends out this process here. Now, now that we can see the cell, we can look for all sorts of mutants that are defective and ask some very interesting questions. For example, we can ask, can we find a mutant in which there's more cells, or maybe no cells? Change the number of cells. Can we find a mutant in which the process doesn't grow correctly? In fact, we've just recently found a strain in which the process doesn't grow this way. From this cell and this cell, it grows that way. We're very curious to find out why it is that the entire polarity, which way the cell grows, has now been changed. Each cell makes a little branch right here. There's also a little one here. We can find mutants that don't branch. We can find mutants that branch too much. So we can ask all sorts of questions about how nerve cells develop. And understanding how nerve cells develop and can rejuvenate themselves is extremely important as we think about how to treat people with spinal cord injury, how we think about people that have neurological diseases like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease. Being able to understand the basic biology of the nerve cells extremely important. We've also used it. This is actually a culture dish in which these cells have been taken out of the animal and we know which they are because they have GFP in it. So we can then study those cells isolated. There's a wonderful machine called the fluorescence activated cell sorter. This machine, if you know the Millikan uh, drop experiment in physics, the charge is put on a drop and then use a magnet to pull it away. He used it to measure the size of the electron, the charge of the electron. This machine uses that same idea. idea. Each drop has a single cell in it. And as those drops come down, there's a laser that hits them. And if they're fluorescent, you get fluorescent light out. They have GFP. If they don't have GFP, nothing happens. But the fact that you get GFP detected in the cells means that there can be a charge put on that drop, and it, the magnet brings it over, it drops in one test tube. Everything else goes into a disparate test tube. So you can sort the cells, that is, get the cells you want separated from all the other cells that you don't want, and then use that to study. And we've used that in our lab uh, a fair amount. We've used this to help us with measuring the electrical properties of the cells. In fact, we use GFP every day in the lab. And I'll give you an example to sort of argue that many other people do as well. But before I do, I want to talk to you about some of the modifications that have been done with GFP. And the person who really started the modification and has probably done the most of anyone to really improve GFP was the third person that shared the prize with us, Roger Chen. Now, Roger uh, always said that he was interested in colors. And uh, among other things, he made a whole series of different colored fluorescent protein. Now, he did this. Uh, at, at first, when we had GFP, that was fine, because green GFP. And then there was a blue GFP that he made. So that was BFP, right? And then there was a yellow green, which he called YFP, or yellow fluorescent protein. But after a while, you start making a lot of colors. You get a little sick of having letters. So he changed the naming of that. And he named the colors after fruits and vegetables. So I think that's blueberry, melon, lime, lemon. I think that's tomato. I'm not sure. And that's cherry. So he named them after various fruits and so on. Now, why would you want to have different colors? Well, one thing is that basically scientists are greedy. If you can do one thing, you want to be able to do two and three and five and 20 and on up. And Josh Sains and Jeff Lickman at Harvard took four of these colors and arranged that the, the DNA that would make these would be expressed in different amounts in different brain cells. So that way, they would have a different mix of four colors in every single cell in the brain, in mice. Now, when they did this, of course, they were getting the entire spectrum. 
And because they were working on nerve cells in the brain, they needed to come up with a cute name for this. So they referred to it as brain bow. And these are some of their pictures. But they're really quite spectacular. They're really quite wonderful. But Roger Chen had another brilliant idea when he did his experiments. He wanted to use the two colors because he knew that there was a wonderful property of fluorescent molecules called Forster Resonance Energy Transfer, or FRET. Now, let me explain what this is. If you have two fluorescent proteins, one that is excited by ultraviolet light and gives off blue, and one that's excited by blue and gives off yellow, if you shine ultraviolet light onto this, then what you get is blue light that's made. A little of the blue light will come over here to the yellow molecule and excite it. You'll get a little tiny bit of yellow. But remember, this is sort of like a light bulb. The light's going off in all directions. Only a little bit comes over here. But if the two fluorescent molecules are close together, something entirely different happens. Ultraviolet light activates the blue molecule. And instead of making blue light, it transfers the energy over to the yellow molecule. And if that energy is transferred to the yellow molecule, it then gives off yellow light. So one way of knowing whether you have molecules that are close together or far apart is to measure how much blue and how much yellow you make. And this is called, as I said, FRET, or Forster Resonance Energy Transfer. Now, he realized that this would make a wonderful tool because all of this it's just protein. And that means you can make the DNA to encode this and put it into any animal just like you put GFP or any of the other fluorescent proteins. But he designed this in a very clever way so that this part of the molecule is a part of a molecule that binds calcium ions. And when it does, it changes its shape and brings these two molecules close together. So he had a way of measuring calcium in the cell. Just had to have the DNA make this, and the cell would just continually tell you how much calcium it had. And since calcium is a very important regulator of activity in the cells, this was a wonderful way of doing this. You could do other things, too. For example, there are enzymes that break proteins. These are called proteases. And so if you took two fluorescent proteins and linked them by a sequence that would be cut by the protease, if there's no protease there, you should get mainly yellow. But if there's a protease and it breaks it, now if you shine ultraviolet light on here, you should get blue. So you can see how much enzyme activity you have in a living cell. People have now made well over a couple hundred different examples of these molecular monitors, ways of measuring activity within cells. And they've turned out to be exceptionally useful in all areas of biology. Now, our paper was published in 1994. And we, in those 17 years since then, um, it's been really hard for me to estimate how many people have actually used it. You go to PubMed, which is the main journal database. There's something on the order of 30,000 papers that have used this or one of the fluorescent proteins. The problem with that is that now people never even say in their title or their abstract or the beginning of their paper, their key words, they never say GFP. It's always hidden into the paper. So no one knows if they're using it or not. I actually estimate that in the 17 years, there's probably been some closer to about 100,000 papers that have been written. And this is an example of one issue of one journal. Uh, it is. So the January 2010 issue of the Journal of Cell Biology. There were 13, or sorry, there were 11 articles in this journal. And as you can see by just the fact that there's words following all these numbers, all but two of them used the fluorescent protein in their experiments. Sometimes they use it in two different ways in their experiments. I am working on these two people to get them to use GFP. Not really sure. But it's been exceptionally useful in all areas of biology. 
genetics, developmental biology, cell biology, neurobiology, where people want to follow things going on. People have studied how HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, is transmitted between cells in mouse, and actually gave them a, quite a number of surprises looking at that. They've looked at parasite host interactions. They've looked at other types of infections. They've looked at genes that have been found to be the basis of human disease that you can now study in mice and follow what happens with them. But GFP has been used in many ways, and I want to tell you one example that I am particularly happy about. I had nothing to do with this one either, but it's one that I think sort of shows that if you have imagination uh, and the technology is available, there's some rather remarkable things to do, or at least potentially can do, because the experiment I'm going to tell you did not succeed perfectly. And people are still working to make it, to actually get it to work. The story starts with a man named Bob Burlow in uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, in the United States. He now is at University of Milwaukee, uh, University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. And he heard about GFP and he knew that there were some bacteria that had a rather unusual property. They had a gene that the gene got turned on, activated, in the presence of the explosive TNT. But TNT is a nitrogen compound and they probably evolved, probably evolved from something that detected a plant that that actually turned out to be a plant. So he decided he would take that regulatory region, one that was turned on in the presence of the explosive, and he would have that drive GFP. And in his petri dishes, he could show that if he put TNT in his dish, the bacteria glowed brightly with GFP. How would you want to do something? Well, one of the absolute worst aspects of warfare is that combatants all too often leave landmines well after the hostilities have ended, and these kill, and while the hostilities are going on, they kill innocent people. And they leave them. And so it's rather horrible. So his experiment, which worked the first time, but not very well the rest of it, he had a friend get five landmines. He disconnected it. He's not a stupid person. They were disconnected, but they still had the TNT. And he put them, he had his friend bury them in a three by five meter plot of wood. He then sprayed the top of it with his bacteria. He came back later at night with an ultraviolet lamp. He got back to it. And he was able to find the land in that plot of land. Now the problem is that it's, the GFP also gets turned on by some plant proteins, so it's not specific enough. And that's the problem uh, with the experiment. But I like the idea, you know, too much of a kind of scientist, you know, people would say, you know, is this going to hurt people? Is this going to do something bad? Is it another atomic bomb that you might hit? It, 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 it's a little disconcerting. Here's an example of somebody thinking about what can we do that to help people and using the designs to do that. So I quite like Another question people ask me often is, has this been put into humans? Now, I only know of one example. It's been put into human cells in culture, but I know of only one human that is reported uh, to have been put in, and I'll show you a picture of this individual. <laughs> If you look at the beginning of Amy Lee's movie, Hulk, you will see that the movie credits start off with a jellyfish floating there in the water, and then a syringe comes in and takes out all its GFP. But Shimamura had known that, and she kind of just turned it much faster. But uh, in any case, uh, I, asked, I happen to know the man who writes for Anne Lee, the, the screenwriter. His, his daughter and my daughter went to school together in New York. And so I went to him, I was very excited. I said, my lab made me go see that movie. And I really liked the beginning a lot. How did you know about my work? And he looked at me and he said, 
It turned out that on the set there was a student from MIT. And he said, I have an idea of how you can make the health free. Give them some, the gene for GFP. So this is a gene that gets turned on with anger. It's expressed in the skin. So he's sort of like the equivalent of Alba, the bunny. In any case, let me finish by saying what I think are some of the lessons that I've gotten from this story about GFP. The first is that there is no one correct way or towards scientific success. Roger Chen was a student who, as a high school student, won the, the, the biggest prestigious prize that he had. The best of the, at that time, called the Westinghouse Award, uh, now called the Intel Award, uh, Science Town. So and he won that as a high school student. Uh, I told you the story of, of Sherman Moore. Um, I'm not going to show you my grade, but for my chemistry grades. Um, here, uh, there is one particular way of doing it. I think you have to just enjoy what you're doing and want to keep going. Uh, the second point I want to make is, as with Kim is throwing his stuff in the sink, most, I think most discoveries are made by us. But unexpected. And in fact, the Nobel laureate uh, in uh, uh, Enrico Fermi, sorry, Enrico Fermi said a wonderful thing. He said, if you do an experiment and it confirms your hypothesis, then you have made a measure. But if you do an experiment and it doesn't confirm your hypothesis, then you will not stop. I think we have a lot of things to make. We go on to the third point. Sometimes you just have to do the experiment and don't listen. Just stop listening to what other people say about whether it's going to work or not. You have to be stubborn or willful. It helps to be stupid, not know what the right answer is supposed to be. But sometimes you find something else. There's a long tradition in science that goes by various names. It's either called a Saturday afternoon or San Saturday morning or Sunday afternoon or Sunday morning experiment. This is an experiment where you have an absolutely lunatic idea. You're embarrassed to say the idea to anybody. So you sneak into the lab on the weekend. And you do that experiment. If it works, you tell everyone on Monday. If it doesn't work, you just go back to work. Next, I think that scientific progress is not made by one great person doing an experiment that then leads to everything else going. I hope you get from this story about GFP that if it wasn't for Shimamura, my contribution and Roger Chen's contribution, we wouldn't have those 100,000 people working on it. But it's not even the three of us. We're really representative. I think that this prize this prize could have been given in biology, or the medicine physiology prize, could have been given in chemistry. I think it's rather nice that it was given in chemistry because the prize went to the molecule. It was really a quite remarkable thing. And it really is that there have been thousands of people that have contributed to making GFP the useful reagent that it is. And in fact, I like to think about GFP as a metaphor for what we do as science, scientists. So just as GFP absorbs light of one color and converts it and emits it as light of another color, we as scientists take in information from other people's work, modify it by our own observations and thoughts and experiments, and then give it out again in a new form for other people to change in turn. And it's really this constant handing off that really is what happens and makes progress in science. The people that actually do the work and should really get the credit are the postdocs and the graduate students and the undergraduates that work in our labs. When we were just starting to send out GFP to people, the heads of the lab would call me up and they'd say, almost invariably, they would say, I hear from my graduate student or I hear from my postdoc 
that you have something called green fluorescent protein, and they want me to get it from you. Tell me about it. And I tell them, and they say, yeah, we should get it. OK, we'd like to have that too. But it was always the postdocs and the graduate students that were getting the bosses who were sitting in their offices probably playing computer games um, to get to work and get that reagent for them because they wanted it for their experiments. It's certainly the case in my lab that the lab really runs on really brilliant people that are working with me. Next thing I want to say is that I hope that you've gotten from this story that all life should be studied. In biology these days, we hear a lot about what are called model organisms, organisms that will be models basically of human biology. And there's only a few of these. So people use yeast and C. elegans, this nematode, fruit flies, mice, and not a lot more. And they're supposed to be representative. Well, none of those organisms, including humans, make light. And none of them have a fluorescent protein in them. But it's been exceptionally important for what we're doing. And so all the work on the non-model organisms, I think, is extremely important. And I know a lot of it is being done here in Brazil, and that's very nice. And I think it's absolutely necessary. And my final point is that basic research is really essential for understanding uh, even applied problems. And in fact, I think that it's the basic research that is the driver of that gives us insights into industry, biotechnology, agriculture, and so on, and medicine. Right now in the United States, there's really, to me, a terrible situation going on. There's a big call for what's called translational research. Now, translational research is where you apply basic research to trying to find a cure or something to prevent a human disease. Now, especially as I get older, this is, sounds wonderful. It's really terrific. But as many people have said, if you want to have translational research, you have to have something to translate. And in fact, you look at the human genome. We know the whole sequence of the human genome. We know what the proteins are that are made. Unfortunately, most of those proteins are still labeled as a protein of unknown function. We have no idea how it works or how it interacts with other proteins. We know woefully little about biology. And to think that maybe we should just stop doing any basic research and just go after the applied research, I think is a major problem. When the economic downturn occurred in the United States, uh, the National Institutes of Health had what's called stimulus money. And the first amount of the stimulus money went to 100 challenges people could apply for that money. Of the 100 challenges, two were basic, 98 were translational. I'm not against translational research. What I am against is the proportion. You need to have the basic research because it's what starts this. I like to say to people, you know, there was probably no, there probably was no recording company, there was no film company that said in the 1950s, you know, we need a new way of reproducing our work. I, we've heard of a new technology called the laser. We should support that. We get CDs, DVDs, and all the other uses of the label came out of very basic research. So I'm going to leave you with a quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. It was uh, from uh, Robert R. Wilson. Now, Robert Wilson was the person who was the first director of the Fermi Lab, the accelerator, the particle accelerator in the United States. It was built in 19, the late 1960s, or actually early 1970s. And he was not only the man who was the first head of it, he actually designed the place. He was the architect. He also was a sculptor. And if you go there, you can see his sculptures on the ground, which are quite interesting in themselves. One of the things I like about Robert Wilson is he did this funny thing. He built a tower, which is now called Wilson's Tower. And it has a wonderful, magnificent observation deck so you can see all around the area. And 
the way he decided how where he should have the observation deck and how tall the building should be is he hired a helicopter. They just had the pilot just keep bringing him up, and finally he said, yep, this is high enough. This is what I want people to see. What's your, what's your height? Where are we? And that's how they built the building. But before they were doing the building, they needed to get the money from the US government. This was a very expensive operation. And it was 1969, and he went to testify before Congress. And at the hearing, he was asked by a senator who wanted to support him, but was trying to figure out ways that his colleagues would go along and vote for all this money being spent on this basic science project, which, by the way, has given us one of the best treatments for cancers. But that's a side the fact. And so the senator says to Wilson, Dr. Wilson, please tell the rest of my colleagues why this facility will help national security. And he said, it won't. And he said, no, no, really. How will this benefit, uh, benefit the national defense? He said, no. He kept pushing. And finally, he said that it's not going to benefit the national defense. He said that the laboratory had only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of men, our love of culture. It has to do with whether we are good painters, good sculptors, great poets. I mean all the things we really venerate in our country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending the country except to make it worth defending. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Martin, for your exceptional lecture. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Be happy. Uh, well, gentlemen, let's speak in Portuguese. Vocês podem fazer perguntas. Vamos fazer poucas perguntas. Duas aqui, a segunda coordenador, porque ele tem que ele encontrar. Ele vai ali para o complexo do Alemão, a gente vai levar para Paris, passeio turístico, pegar o bondinho. Ele vai encontrar o ministro ali da, da, para abrir a Sema de Ciência e Tecnologia. Então, quem tiver... Podem, vocês podem fazer pergunta em português, se a gente tra traduz. E aí, gente? É da timidez, ó. Quer ver duas mãos levantadas. Professor Aurélio. I'm not Shame. that scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, first, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, well, you talked about of what you discovered, and since we are all here and we want to learn what's coming up next, so I wanted to hear what are your dreams now, because. I think that's what keeps us moving. So, as I said at the beginning of the talk, I never started off working on GFP. GFP was sort of a mistake. I'm very happy for that mistake, but it's something that I wasn't really working on. So, I was working and have been working on the sense of touch, how, how cells are made, nerve cells are made. I'm interested in genetics of nerve cells. And I have, after we published the paper in 1994, we had one other paper on GFP many years later. But almost everything we've done in the lab has been on these nerve cells and trying to understand how they are mechanically stimulated. Uh, some of the experiments I'm doing right now, or the lab is doing right now, um, we, we've discovered uh, we, we're, we're trying to look at genes that actually are important in determining the connections between nerve cells. 
called synapses. So we're, we actually have found some genes where that are expressed in some of the touch sensing cells, but not others. When they're expressed in one cell, they allow that nerve cell to make a connection with another. We're going to try to put it in the other one, see if we can change the connection. So we're looking at how do nerve cells connect up to each other? That's one of the questions that we find out. Uh, another question is just about everything in biology. Everything in biology goes in two directions. You make protein, you degrade protein. You make RNA, you degrade RNA. You have a muscle that brings your arm up like this, you have another muscle to bring your arm back. When you eat a big meal, your liver takes the glucose from the meal and puts it in the glycogen in your liver. When you sleep at night, you're not eating, you need glucose, the glycogen comes apart and you then have glucose for later. So everywhere in biology, there's always this give and take, these opposites. And all of our mutants up till now have been mutants that are insensitive to touch. Now, if you have a mutant that's insensitive, that meant whatever was defective, whatever was not there, was needed to make them sensitive. Okay? Because you get rid of what makes them sensitive, they become insensitive. But we're sure, I'm absolutely positive, there are other genes that do the opposite, that tone it down. There are conditions that you need to not be as sensitive to touch, to change it. And we're now starting to go after that. And we have a few that look like they do modulate. And some of them are very interesting. You never, the wonderful thing about genetics is you find a mutant, you clone the gene, you study the gene, and you suddenly are doing a completely new project because the mutant tells you what it is. It, it's not you going and saying, I want to study this particular thing. So we're studying, we're suddenly looking at the worm's insulin. Very interesting thing. We found one insulin. Well, we're just starting to look at this now. But we found one insulin that when you get rid of it, there are several in the world. To get rid of it, the animals become insensitive to touch. And this insulin is not made by the touch sensing cells. It's made by a cell very far away. At least that's what we're testing right now. Well, in people, people that have type 2 diabetes, adults that have it later as I recently learned that one of the very first reasons they go to the doctor is because they say, I'm numb in my fingers. I can't feel anything or I'm my feet. And we're wondering whether there may be some connection between these two. So those are some of the directions we're going. We don't know if those are the answers. We could be completely wrong. Uh, that's part of the fun of it, too, is trying to calm your nerves <laughs> while you're doing the experiments. É. Ah, eu tá pedindo para encerrar, mas quem de repente tiver uma pequena e rápida questão, muito pequena, só para ele não ficar em número ímpar. O ministro está esperando I, ele. Uh, nowadays there are lots of pressures in these kinds of discoveries for you to patent. I don't know the right name in, in English to do a patent. Okay? There is a lot of the pressure for to, yeah, to patent yeah. it. So in your time when you discovered this process and doing, using GFP, there was also a pressure. Did you think about it? And what do you think about this nowadays? So there's patenting and there's patent, right? There's, if you discover something, if you invent something, uh, and that invention is used by someone else to make money, then you need patent protection. And so GFP was patented, as was Pressure, and I did patent, not the sequence. We patented the use of it as a marker for doing various types of experiments. Uh, I don't think the patent was all that good, um, because uh, it was very interesting. A couple, of, a couple of years after it, we had a bunch of new students in our department. And I heard from one of them that there was a rumor going around that because of the GFP patent, I had become a millionaire. And I had to assure them that it was, I was actually, I had got a little bit of money. I had become a hundredaire from, from them, uh, from this. Uh, I don't 
see anything wrong with patenting discoveries or uh, inventions that people make. But, so, but I also, at the same time, patenting doesn't mean that you restrict people from using it. So we gave out 1,500 samples of the DNA for GFP to people, absolute for free. We, they wrote us, we sent it to them. It just got distributed all over the world. Eventually, we got tired of licking the envelope, so we just said somebody else could do this. But, uh, and there's places now that will distribute these things. But we gave it out freely to investigators so that they could make other discoveries. Because if they make another discovery, then that just adds something to what GFP is. It, you, know, it, you want people to do that. What I'm very much against in terms of patent is when people use patent protection to prevent things from happening. I was talking about patents allowing people to use it. They license it. The real problem is not the patent. It's the licensing, letting them use it. And you may know that in the United States, there's a lot of controversy over a company called Myriad Pharmaceuticals that found the genes uh, that didn't find the genes. That was Mary Claire King uh, who found the genes. But they were the first to clone the genes for breast cancer. And they patented the sequence. And they said, no one can look at this other than us. You just cannot use this stuff at all. And so they just tied everything up. Well, nowadays, this is going to be a very big problem. You read in the news a lot about people that are trying you know, to get the cost of sequencing, not a gene, but our entire genomes down to $1,000. And it'll be lower than that. If that happens, you'll get the sequence of every gene you have. And if a woman has the sequence, of, what is she supposed to do? Not look? to see whether there's any problems with the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene, because they have a patent on it. It's supposed to be blacked out when the company sends you that DNA that you don't have it. I think keeping things secret is really problematic and not a very good use of patents. But I do think people that do invent things need protection. I hope that answers you. Hey, senhores, então, mais uma vez, let's thank uh, Professor Martin Chalfi for uh, his talk. Thank you, Professor. Obrigado pela presença de todos.